Hey, Christ UMC family, coming to you again here, but from a different location. Thanks to Joe who came and helped me set this room up and try a couple of different approaches to improve sound and maybe some lighting. Uh, this is our youth room, and uh, behind me you can see some of the things that uh, our youth put together, and I'm excited to be here and uh, start moving this thing around the church so you guys can see the rest of your building and to see what's going on around here. Um, so before that goes any further, we are going to go ahead and get started um, with our upper room devotional for the night. Um, and it starts off, and we're doing the uh, March 27th uh, version of that tonight, and I'll link the upper room version for you in the post thread uh, tonight after we get done posting this thing. Uh, we'll start with uh, checking out James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Post this at all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger, so throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation the garden of your life. It's an interesting scripture to look at when we start to talk uh, about James. It's a short letter. In fact, uh, I can remember as a little boy, it's one of the first books of the Bible that I ever read. Um, I went to a study with my dad at a Lutheran church where when I was in like second or third grade, they thought it was kind of weird that a kid wanted to show up for that Bible study, but I really enjoyed it. And with James, there's lots of issues. The church itself um, is at struggles with itself, at odds within. There's a lot of backbiting and arguing amongst people. There's favoritism happening in the church uh, amongst the wealthy and the rich. Uh, and they're not loving their neighbor and taking care of the poor. And one of the main thrust points of the letter of James is faith without works is dead. The, the idea that we can believe in God's love. We can, we can understand Christ. But if that doesn't somehow change us, if that doesn't get in our bones somehow and make us live and act and move and breathe differently in the world, then what's the point? It's pointless um, to have encountered that kind of love and freedom uh, to just not be changed by it. Not only that, but not to seek to love others and to help them to see what you've seen. James can't see how our faith isn't directly connected with our works, the way we live. And he doesn't argue that it's our works that save us. That's not the point here for James. What he's trying to make sure that we understand is that our works are, are the fruit of God's love bubbling out of us. We can't help but do those things to help work to make peace in the world. And to help those who are struggling in this time, in this place, we can, we can really relate to that. Uh, James' letter can speak to our church today. Uh, and there's a lot of arguing and uh, backbiting that we can start to see. You know, what's the right way to respond? How ought we do the best things with God, what God has entrusted us with? It's been difficult as leaders have had difficulty understanding uh, what's the right path to take and, and whether churches should be opened or closed or, oh my gosh, when should we open it? Is a deadline Easter or not? And we've got to wait and see. And, and James would agree, says over and over in there, wait on the Lord. It's not about our actions and, and what we decide to do. It's about what God does in and through each and every one of us. Now, James was also the or at least with the author is attributed to being James, the brother of Jesus, the first early leader of the church um, in Jerusalem. And he was very, very strictly uh, one who adhered to the Jewish law. And so for him, the law and the works were connected and in a way that was intimate and personal for him. And so the church wasn't even uh, all of one line. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, he struggled a little bit with James because he saw it at odds with Paul a little bit. And, you know, we all have to struggle in our own faith journey with how to respond to what God has called us to do. 
But if any of us cross that line and think that what we do has saved us or gained us merit or favor with God, we've gone too far. But yet, if we don't act, where's the fruit? Where do people look at us and see God's love in the world? So it's kind of a weird tension place for us. And so I'm struggle, uh, I encourage you to, to read James, to, to take a little bit of time. It's four short chapters. Look at the beginning, the end, and all the parts of that short letter. Uh, it's a really incredible thing to do, and you got some time. All right, now let's look at our uh, devotional today. Um, and again, it's Upper Room, March 27th. Every day when I turn on the news, I see horrific stories of destructive wars, persecution, and mass shootings occurring around the world. Not only do these events anger me, but they also tempt me to lose faith in the goodness of humanity. I begin to wonder, why does God let evil harm the lives of so many? After I began earnestly praying for peace, God showed me that it is my responsibility to make the world better in whatever ways I can. Instead of allowing the evil of others to form violent thoughts in my mind, I can focus on doing the small things that God asks of me. Instead of resenting those whose lives are spreading evil, I can remember the Lord said, the vengeance is mine, I will repay. You can look for that in Romans 12. We are all affected in some way by atrocities that occur around the globe. Instead of focusing on the bad in the world and using violence to fight violence, we can focus on our ability to spread love and goodness. We can find comfort in knowing that God's righteous will be the final word of justice. Now, when I become enraged and discouraged by an attack on humanity, I think, what can I do today to spread a little more of God's love? There's some hard questions in there that this... Uh, devotional seeks to get us to question and that first one is why does God let evil harm the lives of so many it can be really easy in times of difficulty to think that that God is punishing or judging or condemning and that God isn't moving and acting in the world somehow we can start to wonder where are you what are you doing why aren't you showing up but you see, God is always showing up, showing up ahead and behind, above and below. God is working out goodness and mercy and justice before the struggle. It's just we who need to have eyes and ears to see and hear. And so we can respond one of two ways when we see the ugliness in the world or the things that cause us such fear and struggle. We can respond with anger and frustration and we can point at and blame people and say why didn't you do this or you should have done this but the other thing that we can do is recognize that God is in control that God is good all the time that God's love is never ending and never ceasing so we can have faith in that take confidence in the fact that God is showing up, will show up, and has already shown up. So then what, we do, what do we do? This lady says that she prayed for peace. She started to turn her will over to God's. And rather than letting the evil things that are happening in the world, the ugly, horrific things, rather than letting the news, no doubt that is just pummeling your eyes and your ears, Rather than allowing that to get deep inside of you and cause you to worry and experience fear and frustration and anger. You're invited to just let it in and turn it over to God. To be at peace with that. But you're not called to be at peace alone. You see this devotional is pushing you just to nudge you just that one step further. To not just be at peace, but to be at peace and then move into action action to help and reach out to others because we're all affected we're all affected by tragedies whether it's during this time and place where we're struggling with the coronavirus and and, and being sheltered in and, and losing so many of our traditions and in events and outings and plans and vacations rather than mumbling and murmuring and complaining we can say okay god we know that you're here. What little thing can I do 
What thing can I do in response to that? In fact, the devotional says, rather than become enraged and discouraged by attack and on ugliness and on the horror that you see about the bad news or the things that you're dealing with, you can ask yourself this, what can I do today to spread a little more of God's love? We don't need to have Herculean feats to show God's love. Love is more often than not spelled with these four letters, T-I-M-E. Taking time out to, to make somebody else's burden yours, to pick it up and make it just a little lighter. Just a little thing. And I started looking around in the world today for some ideas of what, what could I show you that's a little thing, but it seems to make a difference. So I was looking online and I, I found an article from Time and then I found several other articles and apparently um, people are taking the time to put bears in their windows so that when kids are out walking with their moms or dads getting exercise during the day, they can go on a bear hunt. <laughs> Which made me remember my son Jacob when he was in preschool. He had a, a song that this entire event that they've done called Bear Hunt is rooted on. Uh, he used to come home from preschool every day and sing this song. And essentially the song has a, uh, it's a repeat after me song. And it has them going through long grass, swish, 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 and then a deep river, squish, 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 and through the mud, and then through a narrow cave, tiptoeing inside until they see a bear. And then they're scared, and then they run. Back through the grass, back through the mud, back through the river, back through the cave, and I messed up the order, but the idea is still present you get the repetition of the song, but there's a piece that happens over and over and over throughout the song. And I thought it was really, really important for us today to hear it. And it goes something like, we can't go over it. We can't go under it. Oh no, we've got to go through it. That's I think where we're at today. We can't get over, go over coronavirus, it's here. And we can't go under it or get away from it. There's no way around it. There's only one thing left we can do. We can go through it. Through it together. Through it as a community. Through it as church, as family, as friends. Through it as a nation. Through it as a world. The question is, how are we going to go through it together? What's your heart going to be like? Because we could complain about the tall grass. Or we could complain about the deep river or the thick oozy mud or the narrow dark cave and definitely complain about the bear that's going to chase us. And just because we can't go over it and we can't go under it, we can still go through it with hearts centered on God's love, focused on his peace and mercy that he offers to all people. So maybe you could put a bear in your window. I've seen pictures where they put the mask on the bear and you can connect with people through something that is at a distance but shows that you care. It's a little thing, a small action. I promise you that whether it's during this time of coronavirus or the rest of your journey with Christ in this life, that it will be the little things that get you through, reveal hope, and help us get through it together. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you that you are the God that shows up, the God that is present in the midst of all of it. So we ask that you would give us each peace this nice night, rest from the burdens of endless news and constant narrative of fear, constant blaming that occurs as we point fingers at others. Help us, oh God, to be those people who can do the little things to show your love. Uplift our leaders and all those nurses and doctors, first responders, and essential people to, our, our, to this issue that we deal with now and help us to see 
that each and every one of us is essential, divine, daughters and sons of God. In your gracious and holy name we pray. Amen. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.